Hello, all you freedom-loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. A new case is brought to light that military ballots can be requested and sent out without photo ID or voter registration. And Alabama passed a law where a person can be convicted of a Class C felony if he knowingly receives payment for handling someone else's absentee ballot application. President Trump's preferred candidate won the contentious Ohio Senate primary and former DeSantis donor Robert Bigelow and New York Jets owner Woody Johnson are to raise funds for President Trump at a prestigious fundraiser. The Georgia judge, Scott McAfee, will allow the review of his decision to not disqualify Fannie Willis. This could lead to her being disqualified and possibly end the case. Michael Cohen, who was a witness against President Trump in the civil case brought by Letitia James that led to the $355 million fine, was denied an early end to his probation. And the first day of the impeachment inquiry of Joe Biden already saw some damaging testimony from Hunter's former business partners. Okay, let's get into it. On Wednesday, Kimberly Zapata was found guilty on all counts against her for illegally requesting military ballots. Zapata, the fired Milwaukee Election Commission Deputy Director, was accused of illegally requesting military ballots and sending them to State Representative Janelle Brangen. Brangen then reported Zapata to the authorities. The Thomas More Society attorneys, along with Representative Brangen, Eric Cardall, and Michael Gableman, filed a lawsuit on Friday, November 4th, 2022. In this case, the prosecutor said that Zapata used her position to cheat. Yet Claire Woodall Vogue, the Milwaukee Election Commission director, believed that Zapata was attempting to point out that military ballots can be requested and sent out without photo ID or voter registration. Her defense attorney also tried to prove that Zapata just wanted to expose loopholes in the system. However, prosecutors said in 2022, Zapata ordered military ballots using names she made up. Assistant District Attorney Matthew Westfall said, She brought to light the situation by lying on these applications, by having these fraudulent ballots issued. That's not blowing the whistle on the problem, it's aggravating the problem. Woodall testified that in 2022, they received about 300 military absentee ballots. About five to seven of those were fraudulent. The case also highlighted the fact that military voters in Wisconsin do not need photo ID to receive absentee ballots. On Wednesday, Alabama Governor Kay Ivey signed Senate Bill 1, SB 1, into law as part of the Republicans' efforts to enhance election security. The law has sparked several reactions across the state. State Senator Garland Gudger and State Representative Jamie Keel sponsored SB 1. The bill introduces stringent measures against ballot harvesting. It aims to enhance the fairness and integrity of Alabama elections. Under the bill, a person could be convicted of a Class C felony, which is punishable by up to 10 years in prison. That is, if they knowingly receive payment or gift for handling someone else's absentee ballot application, such as by pre-filling the application. Paying a third party to handle an absentee ballot application is now a Class B felony, which is punishable by up to 20 years in prison. There are exceptions to SB1, though, for people who require assistance when disabled, blind, or unable to read or write. In addition, SB1 applies to overseas military personnel. The Fed took the punch bowl away from the party again. The stock market's been betting on March rate cuts, but not so fast. All three indexes got pummeled on the news that rate cuts were off the table. Is this why JP Morgan and UBS are calling for a 23% drop in the S&P? This is the longest time in history between recessions. The recession indicator is ringing its most severe alarm in 40 years. Either you think Bidenomics is working or you're thinking about buying gold and silver to protect your retirement. It's time to call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group. Call them today before it's too late and tell them that Front Page with Scott Goulet sent you and you'll always get the best in class service 
from Patriots, protecting Patriots. The Patriot Gold Group has the no fee for life IRA, where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver, and you may be eligible for the no fee for life IRA and qualifying rollovers. So call the toll free number 888 Eight five seven zero four nine five, and get a free investor's guide today. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs top-rated gold IRA dealer seven years in a row. Again, call eight 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 five seven zero four nine five. That's eight 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 five seven zero four nine five. On Tuesday, President Trump made a clean sweep of the presidential primary contests. Republicans held nominating contests in Arizona, Florida, Illinois, Kansas, and Ohio. President Trump was obviously projected to win every state. President Trump has enough delegates to secure the nomination for the Republican Party. On the same evening, President Trump's preferred candidate won the contentious Ohio Senate primary. Before heading into Tuesday's contest, Businessman Bernie Marino received endorsements from President Trump, along with Wyoming Senator John Barrasso and Ohio Senator J.D. Vance. Marino's win over both State Senator Matt Dolan and Ohio Secretary of State Frank LaRose was proof of President Trump's influence in the contest. Marino now will face Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown in the November contest. This is widely regarded as one of the Republican Party's best opportunities to win a seat in the battle for the upper chamber. On April 6th, a billionaire enclave in Palm Beach will be staging one last major fundraiser for President Trump. This will be a huge donor event hosted by mega investor John Paulson. Tickets for the event start at $814,600 for a seat at President Trump's table, other seats are a mere quarter of a million dollars. The event at Paulson's home will be one of the final events of the Palm Beach season. The co-chairs of the inaugural leadership dinner include hedge fund billionaire Robert Mercer and his daughter Rebecca. This is while two years ago they told friends that they had no plans to help President Trump's 2024 campaign. Hotelier and space entrepreneur Robert Bigelow, who gave $20 million to a group backing Florida Governor Ron DeSantis last year, is also another co-chair. Other guests include more reliable Trump donors, such as New York Jets owner Woody Johnson, who was President Trump's ambassador to London. The guests also include Wilbur Ross who was President Trump's Commerce Secretary, and Linda McMahon, the co-founder of the World Wrestling Entertainment, and Senator Tim Scott, Governor Doug Burgum, and Vivek Ramaswamy are also listed as special guests. Paulson said, I am pleased to support President Trump in his re-election efforts. His policies on the economy, energy, immigration, and foreign policy will be very beneficial for our country. As we previously reported, Paulson is on the short list to become Treasury Secretary in President Trump's second administration. On Wednesday, Fulton County Superior Court Judge Scott McAfee announced that President Trump and his co-defendants can appeal the Fannie Willis disqualification decision. President Trump's lawyer Steve Sadow called the decision by Judge McAfee highly significant. He said the defense is optimistic that Appellate review will lead to the case being dismissed and the DA being disqualified. Judge McAfee issued a certificate of immediate review. McAfee said, upon review of the defendant's joint motion for the certificate of immediate review, the court finds that the order on the defendant's motion to dismiss and disqualify the Fulton County District Attorney issued March 15, 2024, is of such importance to the case that immediate review should be had. The defense now has 10 days to submit an application to the Georgia Court of Appeals. Then the Georgia Court of Appeals has 45 days to decide whether they will hear the case. On Wednesday, a federal judge refused to grant Michael Cohen's request for early supervised release. Judge Jesse Furman of the U.S. District Court Southern District of New York issued an order suggesting that Cohen perjured himself. 
Judge Furman said that he denied Cohen's request for early release from court supervision that followed Cohen's three-year prison sentence for crimes including tax evasion, violating campaign finance laws, and lying to banks in Congress. Following the judge's refusal this time, Cohen has failed four times to end his probation. The judge also explained why Cohen should serve out the full supervised release, which ends in November. Judge Furman said Cohen's ongoing and escalating efforts to walk away from his prior acceptance of responsibility for his crimes are manifest evidence of the ongoing need for specific deterrence. In a statement posted on X, Cohen said that he believes Judge Furman's decision is legally incorrect. However, President Trump's lawyer Alina Hoba said in a post on X that Judge Furman confirmed what we already know, that Michael Cohen committed perjury and should be prosecuted. As the Manhattan DA says on their website, one standard of justice for all. On Wednesday, the first public hearing in the House Republicans' impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden was held. During the inquiry, two former business partners of Hunter Biden testified extensively about their experiences. They mainly repeated claims that were made in their closed-door interviews. That the Biden family patriarch Joe Biden was involved in his son's dealings with foreign clients in various ways. These allegations starkly contrast President Biden and the White House team's repeated assertions to the contrary. The committee is still struggling to get answers directly from the Bidens in order to address the differences between these partners and Biden's testimony. Another obstacle to the investigation was Hunter Biden's refusal to appear. Hunter reversed course from his previous demands to testify in public. He told the committee that he would not appear at the March 20th public hearing. Hunter Biden's lawyer cited a scheduling conflict with his upcoming court date in California where Hunter is alleged to have violated nine tax laws. Hunter's lawyer also expressed concern about the partisan nature of the inquiry. Both witnesses, Jason Galanis and Tony Bobulinski, alleged that the Biden family used their names and access to Joe Biden to sign deals worldwide. They recounted specific times when Joe Biden was in direct contact with Hunter Biden's associates through phone calls and meetings. Glanis appeared virtually at the hearing from an Alabama prison. He is serving a sentence for his participation in a fraudulent tribal bonds scheme with Devin Archer. In his opening statement, Glanis said, the entire value add of Hunter Biden to our business was his family name and his access to his father, Vice President Joe Biden. Glanis testified about a specific 2014 phone call when then Vice President Joe Biden called into a meeting that Hunter Biden had organized. The meeting was at a New York bar with Devin Archer, Galanis, and two Russian oligarchs, Yelena Butterina and her husband, the late Yuri Lushkov, the former mayor of Moscow. Glanis recounted, Hunter called his father, said hello, and hold on, Pops, then put the call on speakerphone and said, I am here with our friends that I told you were coming to town and we wanted to say hello. After exchanging pleasantries, Joe Biden ended by saying, okay then, you be good to my boy. According to Galanis, Hunter Biden told his father, everything is good and we are moving ahead. Galanis also testified that Joe Biden then concluded the call by saying something about being helpful. Galanis claimed that the phone call had an apparent purpose. He said, it was clear to me this was a prearranged call with his father meant to impress the Russian investors that Hunter had access to his father and all the power and prestige of his position. Glanis also said that a few days after this meeting, Yelena Butterina committed to a 10 to $20 million hard order in a Hunter Biden affiliated business. Tony Bobulinski, the only witness who appeared in person, explained how he met with Joe Biden personally. Bobulinski is a retired lieutenant in the US Navy he was the CEO of Sinohawk Holdings, which was the partnership between the Biden family and the Chinese 
operating through CEFC and Chairman Yu Jinping. Bobulinski described one meeting with Joe Biden in May of 2017. He said this meeting was shortly after Joe Biden left office as vice president. Bobulinski said, Hunter arranged the meeting between his father and me at the Beverly Hilton in Los Angeles on May 2nd, 2017. The sole reason Hunter wanted me to meet his father was because I was the CEO of Sinohawk, the Biden's partnership with CEFC. I was a business associate. Bobulinski described the meeting in detail by saying, as I said earlier, before Joe Biden showed up, Hunter and Jim Biden coached me, sort of outlined that we wouldn't go into a lot of details. So through the 45 to 60 minute meeting that I had with Joe Biden, it was about 10.40 p.m. after he flew across the country. We talked about my background, my family's military background, the different business ventures I've done around the world and the family I worked with. Bobulinski's recent testimony contradicts the closed door testimony from both James and Hunter Biden. Bobulinski accused Hunter Biden and James Biden of perjuring themselves before the oversight committee. Bobulinski explained the alleged contradictions by saying, in his transcript, Hunter confirms that that meeting with Joe took place and incriminates his uncle Jim for perjury by confirming it. Bobulinski also accused Jim Biden of lying to the committee. Bobulinski claimed Jim Biden also lied extensively throughout his transcribed interview before the Oversight Committee on February 21st. And ironically, Hunter Biden in his own testimony as outlined above confirmed that Jim Biden perjured himself. In addition, GOP Congressman Byron Donalds dropped receipts proving Joe Biden obtained money from CEFC, which is the energy company that is linked to the Chinese Communist Party. Okay, now to the money flow, because this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. On August 3rd, they actually stipulate through WhatsApp test, text messages the exact stipulations of the deal. On August 4th, $100,000 is wired into Owasco PC from CEFC infrastructure. Mr. Chairman, I want to submit for the record a, a, a portion of the bank statement for the time period August 3rd of 2017 to August 31, 2017, stipulating $100,000 going from CEFC into the bank account of Hunter Biden through Owasco PC. With that objection, it's ordered. On August 8th, Four days later, $5 million is then transferred from the Northern International Capital account of $5 million to Hudson West III. Hudson West III is a bank account controlled by Hunter Biden and Mr. Gon Wang, a.k.a. Kevin Dong, who was a CEFC associate. That money comes from a Northern International Capital a bank account, a bank account that is tied to the CCP. Mr. Chairman, I want to submit for the record the bank statement demonstrating that transfer. Without objection, so ordered. Okay, moving on. On August 8th, the same time period, there is a wire transfer of $400,000 to Owasco PC from the, How the, the Hudson West the Third bank account. That $400,000, Mr. Chairman, I have the transfer records in the bank accounts from the August time period. I want to submit that for the record. Without objection, to ordered. Now, here's where the fun stuff comes in, everybody, and I got a minute to do it, so we're going to get this done. On August 14th, there is $150,000 that is transferred from Owasco PC, which is controlled by Hunter Biden, to Lion Hall Group, which is controlled by James Biden. I have the records here, Mr. Chairman, of the $150,000 that has gone to Lion Hall Group from Owasco PC. I want to submit that for the record. Without objection, it's ordered. On August 28th, and I believe we have a screenshot for everybody in the room. On August 28th, Mr. Chairman, we have the withdrawal ticket from Lion Hall Group that is signed by Sarah Biden, who is the wife of Jim Biden, for $50,000 to withdraw from Lion Hall Group. I want to submit that withdrawal receipt for the record. Without objection, it's ordered. On September 3rd, on August 28th, actually, Mr. Chairman, we have the deposit reference into Sarah Jones Biden's account on the same day she withdrew it from Lion Hall. I want to submit Without that. Without objection, to ordered. Last document. 
On September 3rd, 2007, from Sarah Biden's own personal account, there is a check that is written to, to Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., the president of the United States today, for $40,000 signed loan repayment. A loan repayment, by the way, that Joe Biden's own personal accountant, Mr. Eric Schwerin, has no record for. I want to submit that for the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, to ordered. To the members of the committee, it is clear that the source of this money came from CEFC, and that CEFC is a company that is directly linked to the CCP and, and uh, actually the chairman of the CCP, the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, Chairman Xi Jinping. With that, I yield. The impeachment hearing was later concluded after Maryland Representative Jamie Raskin filed a motion. Mr. 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 Chairman, I just have a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you. Um, but we've heard for months now um, and seen the, the photo of that BlackBerry with the cracked screen. Does the committee have in its possession the data from Mr. Bobolinsky's phone from which he's allegedly taken these pictures? Because I think we need the data that they keep referring to. And maybe Mr. Bobolinsky could just turn it over to us where we could subpoena it today. We have the images that we have shared with you. Right. I saw the picture of the cracked BlackBerry, but do we have the underlying texts that are being referred to by my friend Mr. Palmer? Mr. Bobolinsky previously said he'd be happy to turn over his phone. We have, we have pictures of all the text message screenshots that we've provided with everyone on the committee. Okay. And all right. Well, of course, he's just given us, obviously, the ones he's selected. I'm wondering whether we could get all of those texts. And I would move that the committee subpoena Mr. Bobolinsky's BlackBerry phone on which messages with Hunter Biden and the Oneida Holdings partners are saved. He stated that he's willing to provide it to the committee, so it should be rather simple. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Okay. There's a motion to subpoena Bobolinsky's BlackBerry. Seconded. Yeah, with the texts that were just referenced by Mr. Palmer. Mr. Chairman, I move. Chair table. recognizes uh, Mr. Jordan. I move the table the motion. There's a motion to table. Uh, I, I request the a motion is to table is not debatable. Uh, as many are in Chairman. favor of tabling may signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Uh, all those opposed signify by saying no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion to table <laughs> well, is agreed to. Mr. Chairman, what we're doing is we're tabling evidence here, which you keep relying on, so I'm going to ask for a recorded vote for that. Yeah. That just makes no sense. A recorded vote is ordered. We'll suspend for a moment. We'll suspend for a moment. We don't, this is a... Uh, People committee hearing, we don't have the clerk. Will somebody go find the clerk? Comer then ordered a recorded vote, and he asked someone to find the clerk so that they could continue with matters. The motion to table was later passed. On Wednesday, Senator Tom Tillis said that he received a voicemail in which someone threatened to find and shoot him over the potential TikTok ban. Tillis said in a post on X. TikTok's misinformation campaign is pushing people to call their members of Congress and callers like this who communicate threats against elected officials could be committing a federal crime. Tillis continued by saying, the communist Chinese aligned company is proving just how dangerous their current ownership is. Great work, TikTok. In his ex post, Tillis also included an audio of the alleged voicemail where a voice can be heard saying, I will find you and shoot you. Okay, listen. If you ban TikTok, I will find you and shoot you. <laughs> um, that's people's jobs, and that's my only entertainment. And people make money out there too. You know, I'm trying to get rich like that. Anyways, I'll shoot you and find you and cut you into pieces. <laughs> Bye. Last week, the House passed a bill to ban TikTok. This is if its parent company, ByteDance, does not divest from it in five months. TikTok has notified its users to call Congress and stop a TikTok shutdown. They said that the legislative branch is planning a total ban of TikTok. On Wednesday, Senate Intelligence Committee Chair Mark Warner said that he is attempting to declassify information about risks from TikTok that he shared with senators. 
The declassification push by Warner is a part of his larger backing of the bill that passed the House last week. On Wednesday, Warner said, we just had a very powerful briefing. I'd like to get as much of the content declassified as possible, but I think there was a reason why when this brief was given on the House side to the Energy and Commerce Committee afterwards, they voted 50 to nothing to move the legislation forward. The World Happiness Report 2024 came out on Wednesday. It says that Finland is the happiest country in the world. This is the seventh consecutive year that Finland has been the happiest country. Denmark follows it in second, Iceland in third, Sweden in fourth, and Israel in fifth. Afghanistan is the least happy country at 143rd place. So what about the United States? The US is listed in 23rd place. This is down from 15th place the previous year. The drop of the overall US ranking is due to a significant decline in happiness among young Americans aged 30 and under. For the first time, the report gave separate rankings by age group. The results differ significantly from the overall rankings. Lithuania topped the rankings for young people under the age of 30, while Denmark became the world's happiest country for people aged 60 and over. Americans 30 and under ranked 62nd globally in happiness. This was behind the Dominican Republic, Brazil, and Guatemala. However, when looking only at respondents over 60, the United States jumped to the 10th place. The happiness rankings in the study are supported by data from the Gallup World Poll. Experts analyzed data on six key factors. This included GDP per capita, healthy life expectancy, social support, sense of freedom, generosity, and perceptions of corruption. Of course, the ranking itself is only based on the answers given by the respondents when scoring their own lives. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you so much for your support of Front Page. Please remember that every like, comment, and share helps more people to see the truth. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you have already subscribed, we thank you, but please double check to make sure that you're still subscribed because some of our audience have reported that they're somehow unsubscribed without their knowledge. We've also heard that many of you don't get notifications of our videos anymore on YouTube. So when you do subscribe on YouTube, please make sure to tap the notification bell as well. Okay, this is our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth. Again, thank you for watching Front Page, and we will see you next time.